before already making the connection to the, to the next theater we are going to move to and, and also reminding us of the Pottery House principle which here seems to be redefined in a way who breaks Iraq and who breaks Libya may become responsible for the Sahel and for <coughs> West Africa. But the connection to the Mashrek, to the region east of the Mediterranean is clear. You, you lined it out, if only by the movement, by the migration mm -hmm. of terrorists who've lost their space or their territorial, um, their territorial dominance in parts of Iraq and Syria. Now, Turkey has been a strong actor in Syria for a long time, but uh, the engagement has changed a little bit uh, last week. Um, when President Erdogan first became prime minister, his lead principle was zero problems with neighbors. Um, today, it seems to be the principle of having no zero friends among the neighbors and even zero friends among the international partners and allies uh, Turkey uses and used to work with. Can you explain to us what the Turkish government actually is trying to achieve with its recent, uh, we, we are not allowed to call it an invasion as Europeans because Mr. Erdogan said, if you call it an invasion, we will send you an invasion of refugees. So we call it incursion. So please explain to us what <laughs> Turkish government is about with this incursion. Well, uh, I actually did have two comments about your introductory remarks, but let me take this first and then get back to that. I think it's been, the Turkish government has been clear on what it intends to do. Two things, and this has been true from the beginning, and this has very broad support in the country. One, there will not be a Kurdish terrorist corridor by the Turkish border. So that has been very clear, very predictable, very consistent from the beginning. So I don't think there's any surprise there. And I think this, in that sense, I mean, if you sort of, you know, we can all sort of think about all convoluted, complex uh, reasoning rationales, but I think that's a very simple statement. And I think it has the full backing of the Turkish people. Now, that's very, it is difficult. It is an economic burden, it's a social burden, it is becoming a political burden, and we have to deal with it. And it seems the only reasonable way, as our friends around the world, including those who have these high values, are very reluctant and unwilling to take those refugees, the only way forward is actually to create a safe zone for them so that they can go back or create the conditions in Syria where they can go back. I mean, how we do it, whether uh, you know, we create a better Syria so everyone can go to their original homes would be ideal, but in the absence of that solution, it seems we need in to come up with something. In absence of that solution, you send them to other people's homes. Yeah. No, 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 no. In the absence of that solution, we need to come together mm -hmm. and think of a solution. Because the problem is, the default absence of a solution means 3.5 million people living in Turkey forever. So it, it's a very asymmetric problem. We, as time passes and the community, international community, does not find a solution, the, the burden, the cost, a cruise on Turkey, not on anyone else. A few billion here, a few billion there, yes it helps, but it doesn't really address the fundamentals of the problem. So in response to your question, the two very clear, very predictable, and I think very coherent, consistent principles, objectives, one, no terrorist corridor by the Turkish borders, two, the 3.5 million Syrian uh, guests in Turkey, they need, we need to find a way forward to bring them back to Syria. So those are the two objectives. Two, two additional questions or footnotes to that. The one is um, everybody calls his adversaries terrorists now in the broader Middle East. So I think we should be a little bit more cautious with the term. Uh, we know about the PKK and its long struggle with Turkey and we know that the YPG, PYD has a very, very strong relationship to say the least to the PKK. At the same time, it seems to be true that from the SDF, which is now being fought by the Turkish army, no shot has ever been fired into Turkey because they had enough to do to organize their self-administration in the Syrian Kurdish areas. So is terrorism here actually the wrong term to talk about, whereas settling of refugees, which are a burden in Turkey, uh, back into Syria, seems to be um, the, 
the main background to that, to that uh, incursion, uh, including an, a degree of ethnic engineering uh, in northern Turkey if you settle Sunni Arabs from southern or central Syria to northeastern Syria, which is mainly Kurdish. And the second part of the question, the second question is, you already had, or there already are immediate political effects to the incursion, which is that the Kurdish administration and their militia, the SDF, has now made an agreement with the Syrian army, with the Syrian regime in Damascus, uh, to invite the Syrian army in. Is that in the end the solution also for Turkey, to have the Syrian regime or the Syrian government uh, recover its authority over the entire country or most of the entire country and have the Syrian army on the border with Turkey rather than an American-backed Kurdish militia? The first one, the definition of terrorism, obviously it is a universal sort of conversation going on, uh, that, that discussion goes on, but in the Turkish case, the PKK has actually inhabited the Iraqi space and from there attack Turkey. So for us, the, the idea of PKK in Turkey is, is, is not how we define it. PKK actually inhabits regions that are south of the border, the Turkish border. So for us, the PYD, P, uh, PKK link, which is very real, the fact that you know, it, it hasn't this or that person or this faction within YPG has not taken a shot does not mean much because that is how, we, I mean, we've experienced this for 40 years. We know how PKK functions and how PKK sort of uh, cooperates with its, uh, with other parties in that region. So it's the kind of risk and the kind of definitional sort of subtlety that the Turkish security sensitivities cannot uh, accommodate. It is just too sensitive because we've lost too many people 40 years and we know how PKK functions and the mere fact that as you've shared, the link with YPG and PKK is very real, I think that is sufficient uh, for Turkish sensitivity. So that's number one. In terms of ethnic engineering, I mean ethnic engineering has already taken place. You're an engineer after all. <laughs> well, I was about to say, you know, my CPU works well with integrated circuits, but not with mid the Middle East. It's very, just too <laughs> complex. Even general equilibrium models are fine. It's just Middle East is too much, but I'm trying. Um, the, I, it seems like the Kurds, or, I mean, not the Kurds, the YPG has already done some of that ethnic engineering. So it's really allowing people to come back, arguably. And the second thing is, if there is indeed, I mean, I understand that our European friends are very concerned about demographic shifts, and that's very understandable. And I think that is the point at which our European friends should say, not allowed, if that happens, if that materializes, then the EU will act. But preemptively, saying that this may happen at some point, and then going after the Turkish operation forcefully with sanctions and threat of sanctions, I don't think is constructive. I do think your concern, your uh, issue about ethnic uh, engineering is a real issue, and the Turkish government, the president himself, has come out and said, no, we are not going to do it, so we can hold him to his promise. And when that happens, if he somehow strays from that very strict rule, then I think our European friends would be rightfully in the position to say, look, we told you we are not okay with this, but we are not there yet, it's not happening. And your other big question is, what's the end game? We don't know. I mean, I, I personally don't know. I can tell you about what I sense will happen. Um, the feeling I get, I mean, I, I understand that they have invited uh, the Syrian government to interfere the Syrian military. But again, this morning, the president says in Kobani and Membij, which is the area where there's a possible uh, sort of conflict with the Syrian army, it, it, that there's cooperation with the Russians, or that Russians are aware of this situation and Russians are cooperating, so it's not going to happen. But my guess is YPG is a tactical instrument for big powers in Syria. I think it was a tactical instrument for the Americans, and I think it may well be a tactical instrument for the Russians. So the Russians, if the, I mean, we know what the Russians want. The Russians want this, uh, Assad and the Turkish, the, the, the Turks to come together so that the, the Syrian, the Syria can be yet again under the control of Assad, and that is the end game for the Russians. So I think they want to steer the whole system towards that direction. 
in going towards that direction, my guess is, as I said, if the Turkish part, our side, <laughs> does not cooperate fully with that scenario, and there's foot dragging for this or that reason, my guess is the, the, the our Russian colleagues, friends, will use YPG uh, instrumentally, will try to bring them together with Assad and see whether that can nudge the Turkish side. And looking at the picture, I don't think Turkey can be at odds and can be in conflict continuously with both YPG and the Syrian government. I think at some point we'll have to choose. Uh, I don't know when that point will come. It may be soon. And between the lines, I think there is some room for uh, some rapprochement with the Syrian uh, central government, Assad. I but guess that's, we that's have the, thank you very much. I guess we have the answer by next year's World Policy Conference. Yes, exactly. Yeah.